Thank you, Pastor Michael and Rachel, for leading us in worshiping our Savior today. Well, good morning, friends. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, that's where we're going to be this morning. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, if you want to grab one of the pew Bibles there in front of you, you can find um, Nehemiah chapter 2 on page 370. If you brought a Bible with you and you're not um, familiar with the Old Testament or quite where Nehemiah is found, the easiest way to find it is just take your Bible and just open up to the middle somewhere. And you might be in one of the prophets, maybe Isaiah or Jeremiah, perhaps the Psalms. And just go ahead and just keep moving back until you hit Job. J-O-B looks like Job. And Nehemiah is right next door to Job. So that's the easiest way to find uh, Nehemiah. Just go to the middle, work backwards to get to Job. And then Nehemiah is there right next door um, to Job. And that's where we're going to be uh, this morning. We started our series in Nehemiah this last week. And today we're going to continue on into chapter 2. And as we get ready to go into God's Word this morning... Um, I just want to share a little bit about some things that I had learned early on in college that influenced me um, in ministry and I think have relevance to us today in terms of how we think about what we're going to see in the way that Nehemiah calls the people to continue doing the work of God. When I was in college, I was assigned to read a book by George Barna. Many of you probably have heard the name of George Barna. He's the CEO of the Barna Group that does a lot of statistical work in terms of religious patterns in the United States. And Barna wrote a book in the 90s that was very popular at the time called The Power of Vision. The Power of Vision. And the subtitle is How You Can Capture and Apply God's Vision for Your Ministry. Now, Barna brought at a time when leaders having a vision from God was a very popular phenomenon. It's kind of run its course and not quite uh, so much the same today. But in the 90s into the early 2000s, there was a lot of pressure on ministry leaders to have the right vision. A vision for your church and for your family and for your life as an individual. And if you didn't have a vision, you were in danger uh, or you're putting your people in spiritual danger. So the main verse that Barna and other uh, vision teachers would use came from Proverbs 29, 18. In the King James, the verse goes like this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish perish. And the idea was that if you didn't have a vision for your ministry or for your church or for your life, you're putting people in spiritual danger. They will perish. They will not be led well or fed well, and you'll miss God's best for people if you don't have a direction and vision from God for where you're going. Now, um, one popular writer in the 90s and 2000s um, who led a church in the Chicagoland area called Willow Creek. Some of you may be familiar with the church Willow Creek. It used to be one of the largest uh, Protestant churches in the United States, led by a pastor named Bill Hybels. Um, sadly, Bill Hybels has fell out of favor in the last several years due to some moral failure on his part. Uh, but he wrote a very popular book in the early 2000s called Courageous Leadership. And building on people like Barna and an interpretation of, Philipp, uh, of Proverbs 29, uh, 18, he wrote this, where there is no vision, the people can't focus. They can't reach their goal. They can't follow their dream. I've seen it with my own eyes. Without vision, people lose the vitality that makes them feel alive. This vision is a clear call that sustains focused effort year after year, decade after decade, as people offer consistent and sacrificial service to God. In other words, Hybel is saying, if you don't have vision, you can't give people direction. If they don't have direction, then their dreams and their realities and God's best for them will be completely missed. If you don't have a vision that sustains your church year after year, decade after decade, your church will be in danger of drifting. Now, those of you who are discerning thinkers, critical thinkers, which hopefully all of you are, but for those of you that may have that, may have a knack for that more, you probably notice some things in this definition that maybe catch your attention. Your, your discernment radar should be buzzing right about now because you'll notice who does Hybel say the vision and goal and dream is about? Notice the pronoun there. It says there. Without vision, you can't 
people can't reach their goal or their dream or their potential. I think therein lies the key problem to a lot of the vision teaching that was going on for ministry leaders during the generation in which I was coming to age in ministry is that it was focused on the individual, not so much on what God had to say. Now, God does get lip service there in that bottom paragraph, but if you read the book, you'll find that it's almost always about the individual who has the vision from God and then cast it to the people, and that's what effective pastoring and leadership is all about. However, over uh, getting kind of worn out by the vision language as a young pastor, I did some some uh, some just uh, some more reading on the context of Proverbs 29, verse 18, and began to ask some good L's hermeneutical uh, questions about context and the author, the meaning of the words, so the things that we teach you in our L's program about how to be a discerning Bible reader. I did that with Proverbs 19, and here's what I found. Here's what I found, or Proverbs 29, excuse me. Here's what I found. The ESV translates it this way, which I think is a more, uh, a more uh, correct version of the Hebrew than what we see in the King James. It says this, where there is no vision, the people cast off all restraint. In other words, where the King James says perish, the ESV says cast off all restraint. And again, the idea is that people are perishing because they're casting off restraint. There's no boundaries. There's no guidance. There's nothing there to keep them in the right way. Now notice what the rest of the proverb says. But blessed is he who keeps the law. In other words, what the writer of the proverb is saying is that where God's word is not being taught or spoken of or obeyed, then there is no restraint holding the people back to the purposes of God. There's no restraint to keep them from falling back into sin or sinful patterns of thinking. So this proverb is actually a warning, not about having the right vision from God, but keeping and obeying God's commandments. So the real challenge in leadership is not trying to get the right vision from God and then communicate it to the people so you can achieve all your dreams and have all those kinds of successes. It's about staying true to what God has already revealed. Staying true to what the Lord has already spoken. The real challenge for us as individual Christians trying to influence our families and shepherd our children and be faithful to the Lord in, in, in our vocations and the things that God has called us to is staying true to what he's already spoken. And what we're going to find today as we go to Nehemiah chapter 2 is that Nehemiah is going to call the people back to their first love. Call them back to God, to loving God, serving God, obeying God. That the vision Nehemiah casts is not just simply about a building project, but it's about the renewal, the spiritual renewal of the people's hearts to come back to their God. So my hope today, friends, is that what we see will not only be instructive for you, but also encourage you to also return to your first love and return to the foundational vision that the Lord has given us as, as followers of Jesus, to keep Jesus first and have, let him have the preeminence in all of our life. So with that said, friends, let's pray now and ask for God's help as we turn our attention to his word and hear what the Spirit is going to speak to us this morning through the text. Let's pray. Father, we ask that now that you would be our teacher by the power of your Spirit, that you would encourage our hearts as we study your word together, and that from this historic incident in Nehemiah's life in this previous generation, we would learn what it means to rebuild the proverbial walls of our own day, that we would know what it means to turn to you for the renewal that we so desperately need in our time. So we ask, Lord, that you would remind us of your vision that you have revealed to us in the Lord Jesus and what you've called us to, to love you and to serve you in the same way that you called Nehemiah's generation to do that. So guide us and lead us as we study your word this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, um, last week we started our new series in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is one of my favorite books of the Bible because there's so much 
um, a wealth of practical riches in this book that we can draw from and learn from as, as followers of Jesus today. And we can also see how God preserved his people at a very tumultuous time in their history, at a time when they were in great spiritual danger of falling away from God's purposes and learn from their experience for our own day. How do, we, how do we restore, rebuild the proverbial broken walls in our community, in our churches? For there is much in our culture that is challenging right now. And there are many, again, proverbial broken walls around us. How do we, people, how do we be people who restore and renew and call people back to God's purposes for our lives? So Nehemiah is going to be our guide and our teacher this fall. And we are going to discuss a number of things and look at the practical applications that God's word has for us in our own day. Now, for those of you that are just joining us this morning, or perhaps um, you don't know um, your Old Testament history very well, I just want to give you a, a short review on the context of Nehemiah and where uh, Nehemiah falls into biblical history. In 586, in 586 BC, um, the last remaining tribes of, um, in Jerusalem were taken into captivity by um, the foreign nation of Babylon. So when you read the book of Daniel, for example, um, you have the people in captivity in Babylon. It's called the Babylonian captivity. And the reason they were taken into captivity was because of their ongoing disobedience to God, their ongoing rejection of God and worship of idols. Prophet after prophet had warned them to turn back to God and to repent and to restore true worship of God. The people didn't listen, and eventually they were taken into exile. However, as I showed you last week from Deuteronomy 30, Moses predicted that all of these things were going to happen, but Moses also predicted that as the people turn and repent, and come back to God and seek him with all their heart that the Lord would hear them again and restore them back to their land. So in Deuteronomy 30, we see the whole unfolding of this scenario that we find now in Nehemiah. So in 539, exactly what Moses prophesied happened. A foreign nation defeated Babylon called Persia, led by King Cyrus. And a year after um, Babylon's defeat, Cyrus allows the, the first wave of exiles to go back into their land and rebuild. In 516, the temple that had been destroyed by Babylon when they invaded was reconstructed. In 458, we have Ezra. Many of you know the book of Ezra, which is right next door to Nehemiah. Ezra goes back there as a priest to try to restore the people spiritually. And then we come to 445 when Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls that have been broken down. Now, if you look at these dates and you do the math, there's a number of years between their first return and 445 when Nehemiah comes onto the scene. And so the big question to ask is, why hadn't the walls been built yet? What was going on? Did they not take their security uh, seriously? They rebuilt the temple, which is great, but if you have a temple that's exposed to a foreign army, what good is it? If you don't have the walls to protect your people, what are you doing? Why hadn't the walls been built yet? Had they not thought of it? Did they not care? Like, like do they take things for granted? Like, like, why are the walls broken down? Well, to understand the answer to that question, we have to go back to what the prophets had been speaking at that time. The closest prophet to Nehemiah's time is the final prophet we have in our English Bible called Malachi. So if you look into the, the, uh, the table of contents in your English Bible, you'll see that Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament before we get to the New Testament. And Malachi was within the same time frame that Nehemiah was alive. So Malachi helps us understand what was going on spiritually for the people at the time of Nehemiah. And this is what Malachi speaks to the people from chapter 3. From the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how we robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions. You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. 
that bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Again, you see, the people had not been giving their tithes and contributions to keep the temple in and in operation because they were afraid of spending too much money on it. They were afraid that they wouldn't have enough money for their own families. And so they thought, well, the temple's constructed. It's good enough. It doesn't need all these extra tithes. And Malachi is coming along here saying, by withholding your tithes from the temple, you're actually withholding your capacity to worship God the way he wants to be worshiped. Trust the Lord. Give of your tithes. Give of your offerings so that God's temple may be all that God is calling it to be and see if the Lord doesn't abundantly bless you with your obedience. In verse 11, um, the prophet goes on to tell us that God is saying, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And then in Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, Malachi gives us God's vision for the people, God's vision for Jerusalem, God's vision and purposes for what he wanted with the people that I think is the same vision that was influencing Nehemiah and his decision to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11 says this, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, the Lord's plan for his temple and for his people was for his name to be great and to ring out to the nations and for other nations to come and worship the one true God. But in order for that to happen, God's own people had to be committed to the same vision of making his name great. They had to be committed to worshiping God. They had to be committed to God's plans and purposes for them. So what we find is during the time of Nehemiah is the people are complacent, they're lethargic, and they are falling short of what God called them to be and to do. So the broken walls or the neglected walls is simply a, a, a picture, a word picture of the spiritual condition of the people's hearts. A, a, a picture of the spiritual condition of the people's hearts. So in chapter 1 that we saw last week, the reason that Nehemiah is broken and grieved over the people's lack of concern for their own security simply was rooted in their own lack of concern for the glory and fame of God. For the name of God, their lack of commitment to making the name of God known to all the nations. And so Nehemiah wants to go back there to Jerusalem and restore the people, not just their walls, but restore their hearts back to their first love and back to their foundational commitment as God's people to love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. So with that as, a, as background and context, let's go now to chapter 2. And let's see how Nehemiah makes his request to the king. So remember, Nehemiah is in, um, in Persia in the capital. He's a servant to the, the king, King Xerxes, and he is King Xerxes' cupbearer, which means that he tests the wine and the food to make sure nobody's poisoned it. So not a lot of job security there for Nehemiah, but he's somebody who has access to the king, and he has been praying and fasting about this burden the Lord has given him to go back and rebuild the walls, and he wants to ask the king for help, and he's waiting for God's opportunity for this to, to, to occur. So let's begin here in verse 1 of chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad? And seeing you are not sick, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. So he had not been sad in the king's presence before. 
He put on a good front, and yet the king detects that there's something grieving Nehemiah. And so the king asks him, why do you seem downcast today, Nehemiah? Why do you seem discouraged? And then Nehemiah is very much afraid because he knows his moment is coming. Verse 3, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? And here it is. He tells the king the truth about what's grieving him. And the king says, what are you saying, Nehemiah? And then Nehemiah does what? I pray to the God of heaven. So Nehemiah had spent months praying and fasting and preparing. And here's this moment. So it's like his last final prayer, one of those arrow prayers. He prayed to God at the, la- the final moment. He's like, okay, Lord, here we go. Let's see what happens. And verse 5, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, well, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. So Nehemiah makes this request to go. And then the king says, how long are you going to be gone? When are you coming back? Which is a good sign. Normally, when a cupbearer would make this kind of audacious uh, request of the king, it was off with your head time, right? But that's not what happens. The king obviously likes Nehemiah, trusts Nehemiah, and says, how long are you going to be gone? When are you coming back? This is the work of God in the heart of the king. So Nehemiah then says in verse 7, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy." Then, and the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. So, Nehemiah not only asks for some time off to go back to his homeland to restore the walls, he then asks the king to basically fund the project and provide all the timber and resources needed. And again, the king says, yes. And so Nehemiah says this, this wonderful line that we're going to see repeated throughout the book, that the good hand of my God was upon me. We see God's favor on Nehemiah, guiding his circumstances, changing even the hearts of this pagan king to, to be turned to Nehemiah and to do exactly what God wanted him to do. Nehemiah is a wonderful example for us of what it looks like to have the good hand of God upon you, guiding you each and every step of the way. So we'll see more of that as, um, as we continue on in the series. For now, let's see what happens as he goes back then to Jerusalem. Verse 9, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen, But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So uh, we're going to learn more about these characters next week. But here we begin to see that already that God's work being done God's way is going to get the response of God's enemies. God's work being done God's way will always attract the response of God's enemies enemy. So we begin to see some signs that there's going to be trouble and there's going to be opposition to what Nehemiah is going to do. Verse 11, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God, my God, I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I expected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. 
And the officials did not know where I'd gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. In other words, Nehemiah goes and wants, inspects the ruins for himself. Because remember, up until this time, all he's heard are rumors. All he's heard are rumors about how bad things are in Jerusalem. He wants to go and check it out for himself. And what does he find? Exactly what he'd been told. Everything's broken down, been destroyed by fire. It is in absolute ruins. So now, Nehemiah, having prayed, received the resources needed, he's going to take the next step and cast the vision to the people and call them back to God's purposes. Call them back to God as their first love. Call them back to what we see in Malachi of making Jerusalem a place where God's name rings out to the nations. Listen to what he says in verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. In other words, God has not called us to be complacent, to be lethargic, to have the city in ruins. God has called the city to be the shining city on the hill, a place where the nations will come to worship. Do you not see the trouble we're in by, by, by neglecting the walls, neglecting our temple? Friends, this is revealing what's in our hearts. God has called us to something greater than what we are currently experiencing. This is not the, the low level that God has called us to live in. Look at what God has promised in the prophets. So he, he repeats the words of the prophets. He repeats the promises to them. And then he gives them the key thing that they needed to hear. Verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also of the words that the king had spoken to me. So he tells them, listen to what King Xerxes had said. I got permission to come here. He's funding the project. It's not going to cost you extra money. It's all being paid for by the king. God is in this. Let's rise up and let's build. And with these stirring words, with this vision of calling them back to what God had already promised and revealed, listen to what happens. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Now, again, we get a hint, trouble's coming. We'll get to that more next week. But in verse 19, here's a hint of the trouble coming. But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we as servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. We'll deal with these guys next week. But for now, we see Nehemiah with the vision, calling the people back to God's purposes, calling them to rebuild, to make Jerusalem all that the prophets had said it was to be. So here's your main idea. God calls his people to share his vision for their lives by continuously turning back to him as their first love. That's it. That's the heart of it. Nehemiah was doing nothing other than calling the people back to what Moses had called them to, to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to do that by rebuilding the walls and serving the temple, and worshiping him, that God would do the work that God had promised to do. So here's our application. Do we share God's vision? Do we share God's vision for our church, and our lives, and our families here today? So what I've discovered in ministry is that, again, the real challenge isn't the church or individual Christians or leaders finding the right vision. Instead, it's staying true to the vision that God has already revealed. And for us, on this side of the cross, what is the vision God has shown us? The Lord Jesus Christ in his glory and his purposes and his future coming. What is the vision that God has for his people here 
I think it's summarized beautifully in what our elders have put together. Not to be self-serving. I was, I mean, I was part of the process. I didn't come up with this name. Our elders did. But um, I think it captures the biblical vision of the New Testament wonderfully. So praise be to your elders. And I, um, I, I helped a little bit. I didn't help much, but I helped a little bit. I affirmed it, okay? And it's this, that Christ would be seen by all. That Christ would be seen by all. And this isn't because the elders have these bright ideas and are brilliant. It's because they know the New Testament. They've been taught well that Christ would be seen by all. So if you take this phrase that Christ would be seen by all and you, you put it in Malachi chapter 1 verse 11 terms, what do you find? Is that from the rising of the sun to its setting, may the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be praised amongst the nations. That's our vision. That's our hope. You heard Pastor Michael earlier read from Matthew chapter 28 about the call given to the church to make disciples of all the nations by baptizing and teaching them because the name of Jesus is to be made great and Jesus is with us and will be with us until he returns as we carry out this mission of making his name known to all people, that Christ will be seen by all. When I was new in ministry, it was my, uh, my first year as a youth pastor at a downtown church in, in Spokane, Washington. Uh, small, struggling church. I was working with a lot of inner city kids. Lots of problems. I was young, immature, didn't know what I was doing. Way in over my head. And I had one of our denominational leaders uh, visit us. And so he was asking questions about, about what we were doing. And he asked me this question. And he said, so, what's your vision? And I thought back, oh, he's quoting the... Proverbs 29 thing that's out of context. Oh, he's read the George Barna book that I didn't like. And so I was scrambling in my mind trying to think of like something that I could impress him with. And all that came out of my mouth was, I want these kids to know Jesus. I want these kids to find Jesus. And he wasn't real impressed with that answer. He just kind of said, hmm. And, uh, and carried on. And now later on, we became good friends and we kind of joke about it now at the time when he asked me the vision question. But you know, even though I was kind of stumbling around trying to find an answer, that was the real answer. And that's been the heart of, of my, my, my ministry for the last 25 years, is I want people to know Jesus. And you know, that's the heart of this church as well, for people to know Jesus. When we first got to know Pastor Stan and Mindy, my wife and I, and we were discerning about God's call to move out here and be part of Ells International and part of this church, the thing that, one of the things that impressed us the most is that everything that we saw from Stan and Mindy and we see from all of you is that that's the heart of this church, is that others would know Jesus, that Christ would be seen by all. And we said, yes, we want to be part of this because that's what we want our lives to be about also. So, how do we sustain this vision? How do we sustain our vision and stay true to it? Friends, I have to be honest, I don't, I don't wake up in a cold sweat at night worried that you're going to somehow turn into a progressive church. I don't wake up in the middle of the night and worry that I'm going to come here on a Sunday morning and you're going to say, I don't really know if this is what God actually said. And I don't really know if Jesus rose from the dead. That just seems kind of fanciful to me. Maybe it's just a metaphor. Like I, I don't worry about that with you. I don't worry you're going to become ex-evangelicals. But here's what I do worry about. Here's what I do worry about. I worry that Jesus will be replaced by something else. There's a lot of evangelicals that are very passionate about their cause and passionate about uh, their specific doctrine that they're emphasizing or passionate about this issue or that issue and Jesus sometimes kind of falls into the background. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus gives this warning to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and have not grown weary. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're theologically sound. You're biblically accurate. You're committed to capital T truth. But here's what you're missing. Verse 4. But I have this against you, Jesus says 
that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Somehow, some way, this doctrinally sound, biblically zealous church had lost sight of loving Jesus and putting Jesus first. And friends, that's the danger of conservative evangelicalism. That we are so passionate about having the right doctrine and proclaiming biblical authority and commitment to capital T truth, all of which I agree with and all of which I am, but that Jesus gets lost in the mix. And we forget that ultimately we are biblically sound and orthodox and committed to capital T truth because we want him to be known and seen by all. Friends, let's not let other issues, other things capture our attention our, in our hearts to the degree that we forget that ultimately our task as evangelicals, as Christians, is to point people to Jesus. So how do we stay true to our vision that Christ may be seen by all is for Christ to be seen first and foremost in our own lives and for us to continuously turn our eyes back to Jesus and continuously come to him day by day with open hands and lives surrendered saying, Lord Jesus, may you have the preeminence in my life. May you have the preeminence in my attitude, my words this day. Jesus, it is all about you and all for you. You are the first love of my heart. That's the kind of worship that we're called to offer. That's the kind of worship that I want to offer. And when our hearts are cold, which mine, of, mine often is, and I'm sure some of you have cold hearts at times, or you don't feel that, or there's other stresses in life that are competing against that, that we would do exactly what Jesus calls us to do here in Revelation chapter, chapter 2, and just turn back to him again and say, Lord Jesus, give me a soft heart. Lord Jesus, fill me again with your Holy Spirit that I may be humbled and broken and contrite and give you an offering that you will not reject because he, he, the word tells us that he, he receives a humble and contrite heart and that we would make it all about him. What our nation needs most right now from us as evangelicals is not just our doctrine, not just our commitment to the Bible, that's important, that's foundational, but they need to see Christ in us and through us. This is the vision. This is the vision. May we humbly return to it and make Jesus preeminent in all that we do and say. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and we ask that like Nehemiah, we too would be aware of the trouble that we're in. We see the culture around us crumbling. We see institutions falling. We see churches that are compromising. We see leaders who are compromising. And Father, we want to return to you as our first love. May you keep us true to you. May you soften our hearts and remind us again of your great promises that you will be glorified amongst the nations, that your name will be made great to all people. And Lord, may we, by the power of your spirit, be part of that and showing others who you are and how we live and what we do. I pray for anyone in here that is discouraged today, that is struggling, that is um, perhaps tempted to fall away from you or walk away from you perhaps someone that is hardened against you. And I pray that today be a day that they would be softened and turned back to you. I pray that if any of us in here are struggling and wondering what your vision is or what your direction for their lives is, that you would sweetly, by the power of your spirit, guide and direct their focus back to you and show them what the next steps may be. In all things, may you be preeminent. May you have the glory that you may be seen by all. And we ask this for our church and for our lives. In your name, amen. Now receive the benediction. May the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Let's go in peace, my friends, and serve our God together.